You're listening to Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. We're coming to you from the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations around Vancouver, B.C. I'm your host, Bernadine Fox, and this is the show that dares to change how we think about mental health. Welcome to Rethreading Madness. When I've never been further Knowing what the hell I'm gonna do When I can't seem to find my way Under or over or through Today I'm talking with Susie Mellon about her journey through alcoholism and substance abuse, but more importantly, her road to recovering out loud, and that's what she calls it, recovering out loud. In this, Susie talks about her sexual trauma as a young child and does use some profanity while reciting a spoken word piece that some people may find offensive. So please do what you need to do to take care of yourself in this hour. How can you protect your keys? Simply attach a War Amps key tag to your key ring. If you lose your keys, the War Amps can return them to you by courier for free. War Amps key tags, they're free and they work. Order yours at waramps.ca. You're listening to Rethreading Madness on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. I'm Bernadine Fox and today I'm talking with Susie Milne. Susie and I sort of have been in sort of the same social circles, both being visual artists um, and have met each other, have had dinner with, I think I've had dinner at your place one night, um, but we haven't been real close friends. Um, so maybe Susie, you could not tell yet, folks. Bernie, not, not yet, Bernie, not yet. Not yet, that's right. I actually agree with that. Um, <laughs> maybe you could tell the audience who you are, Susie. Okay, my name is Susie Milne and my pronouns are she, they, and I am a woman who is a recovered woman, and I'm going to read you this little bio. I'm a sober Canadian artist, philosopher, and poet residing on the traditional unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. I'm known for drawings, watercolors, mixed media, and I've done lots of work from that range from paintings, paper, and textile to video and photo-based stuff. I, my, I, I, I call my eclectic practice living art. Mm. I've had, I had 20 um, years in the public service, lastly, as a senior manager of emergency services. And I believe that that achievement is like a form of performance art, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and I, de- I have a dedicated and picturesque history with several founding artist run centers, including a seminal performance um, where I curated this thing called about like this thing Sniffy the Rat, which was a huge <laughs> thing in the eighties. And in fact, if you go to CBC archives, it's there. And they said it's going to be there forever because it was so mm-hmm. wild. So that was really that happened in nineteen eighty nine. And and anyway, so my ongoing engagement with the amazing and robust Vancouver art community carries into the present day and it informs my multimedia practice Mm -hmm. i was just going to say i've exhibited and performed around the world and recently i've got a multimedia video piece up on um something called digitalstories.ca and i've been i had some paintings in um like quite a lot of paintings in another sort of artist co-op called i'm upon and i'm very very lucky to live in an old falling down but beautiful place right beside the ocean and Mm. so i'm very lucky to live here and um yeah so that's who i am can you can you tell us a little bit about your childhood yes um first of all i'm part of an amazing group called she recovers and i wanted to at the end i'll talk a little more about that but part of that is um Part of that group is very, it's wonderful because they have gatherings twice a day for women who are recovering from anything. And what they do is they they get you to come on and share for three minutes and they've got like clinical counselors there and they also have um, like people that are there to keep you safe. But anyway, so one of the things that's really amazing is they get you to say out loud, they call it recovery out loud. And so I am in recovery from all the things that helped me to survive over the years and led me to the following long-term alcohol use disorder, long-term opioid misuse addiction and nearly overdosing twice, methamphetamine addiction, 
body dysmorphia, moral trauma, early childhood, sex trauma, emotional incest, physical incest, intergenerational trauma, and family dysfunction, long-term sexual abuse and trauma, long-term emotional gaslight abuse, chronic anxiety, deep depressive disorder, capitalism, and 5,000 years of patriarchy. Mm. So I say that in that group, and it makes me feel really strong in my recovery. I've got, in June, I took 21 years sober from alcohol, and just last week, I took five years sober from um, opioid opioid use. And my childhood was amazing. I was so lucky in, physically. I, you know, like I lived with my art architecture slash artist parents outside of Ottawa, very white privileged um, near a lake called Kingsmere Lake that was beside a, a beautiful park that had all these ruins in it that's like. Mackenzie King, who was like the Prime Minister of Canada in the 40s and 50s, and he had a summer residence there, and we, we used to go up there and have seances, and he was into all that stuff, and it was like, mm. there were all these adventures, and of course, at that time in the 60s, my mother just used to open the door and say, okay, see you tonight, she'd give us our lunches, and we just go running around the forest all day long, so I had a really nice Things were great, you know, I was mm -hmm. going to a little elementary school and stuff. And then um, when I was about, I don't know how old I was, but I was like 11 or something. And I was sexually assaulted by one of my dad's students. Mm. And, it, um, and so I think that since then, I was thrown into what they clinically call hyper arousal. In other words, I was, I think I've been, I was in fight flight mode for mm -hmm. most of my life. Mm -hmm. and so my whole life is kind of um like okay so I continued thriving through my childhood because you know that's what you do you don't know that I don't know I, I don't need to explain that to you Bernie it's like I, I don't you know I didn't I it didn't let it affect me I couldn't tell anybody about it but I just squished it down and continued on and we had neighbors who had horses mm -hmm. and I was lucky enough to ride horses and I actually won the um Quebec Intermediate Dressage Championships when I was 17. Oh good for you. <laughs> you <laughs> so horses I believe that helped me to learn right away like after the sex trauma I was right then I think I learned started to learn how to self-regulate in some way or something mm -hmm. I don't know and yeah yeah Enjoy. it's it's funny you know learning to regulate um can happen in all different kinds of ways you know I mm -hmm. do that with one of my grandchildren who doesn't know how to couldn't didn't know how to regulate and not really knowing what I was doing, but now understanding that it was about regulating, I would, I would hug him, we would call it a purple calm hug. And he oh. would, I would hug him and then I would just relax my whole body because he'd get oh. really, really hyper and he couldn't stop. And so I'd relax my whole body and I'd say, now you do exactly what I'm doing. And he would just relax his whole body. <laughs> he is the best <laughs> hugger ever. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, we, and I think that animals do that too. I think that's why we have emotional support animals that they can yeah. teach us those things. And horses, um, yeah. I don't think we should underestimate the power of horses in our lives. Yes. And the, seeing those beautiful um, videos of horses going into to senior and disabled homes. Mm. I mean, I don't know if you watch any of those on I TikTok. And stuff. Oh my God. It's amazing. It's amazing. Okay. These big horses so gently putting their little, their, their faces into the hands of people sitting there and that you could just see that it just fills their body with like wow. a feeling of peace. Right. It's amazing. And speaking of regulation, my parents were um, dysregulated uh -huh. and they, they fought a lot mm -hmm. and I developed this habit which I just recently discovered like as a thing in therapy around regulation and I used to get in order to get to sleep I used to bang I used to put my arms under my pillow and bang my head rhythmically on my arms on top of the pillow and huh. do this like loud humming noise and I was always really ashamed of that through my life and now I realize it, I was probably blocking out the sound of their of fighting you were that's exactly <laughs> what you were doing it's amazing right that yeah what an incredible coping skill you developed <laughs> at like age five that's incredible so, <laughs> so when i was three we were living in finland and um 
this was pre everything, but my mom uh, found out that she was going to have to give birth to these twins that she had, my brother and sister, without anesthetic in the Finnish hospital. At the same time, she found out some terrible stuff about my dad and the same time as her mom died. Mm. And so then she had the twins and I think it was overwhelming. And I think, you know, through no fault of her own, she abandoned me. And I have these memories of standing, looking at her back in total astonished bewilderment and it's it's really sad but like i've coped i've dealt with that and i've pushed through that but like you know i think that's when i started to have to you know take care of myself and you know because it was like that was that was it and, right. and so you know anyways so then when i was in my um like I said, I was able to do really well in school and all that. We were encouraged and I got high marks and, and all that stuff. And then I went to high school and everything. And it was all, you know, the crazy stuff in high school. And um, and then I remember the first time I got drunk was when I was about 12. And I was with my friends and we raided the liquor cabinet. And we drank this stuff. And I remember getting so plastered rolling down this hill and thinking, Oh my God, this is the best thing ever. When can I do it again? <laughs> and like, I've told that a that story in AA. Cause it's like the first time I drank, I got drunk. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> so like, tell me, you know, Susie, when, when you had that first drink, did you think this tastes wonderful? This is the this is great. Or did you yes. go, Oh my God, this tastes horrible. No, I, I, we drank, we were drinking like something, you know, like must've been like schnapps and whiskey. Uh, and stuff. Yes. And I remember just loving it. Ah, I wow. loved it right away. But I mean, I didn't know that that's what I was loving. I just thought, Oh, this experience, what we're doing right now is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, but like then, and then I remember the second time I got like absolutely out of my mind, it was like people were serving sherry at a house party or something at an open house across the street in Ottawa when I was about 14 or something or 16 or something. And I remember like, I just remember the feeling of just wanting to go, go, go. And I could never, ever stop. And like my whole life, I could never drink a drink to savor the taste. It was always just to get drunk. Right. And so I started drinking heavily and, and, and during my, you know, teenage years in my social life with people and everything. And I was always the one organizing the parties and getting all the booze and everything. And then, um, you know, it just got, and then I ended up uh, starting to fragment when I was in my early twenties, I was, I was with this guy and he was like a perfectly nice guy. And, you know, in another timeline, I could have you know, ended up with him having children and living in some nice little thing, you know, like, mm -hmm. like my, you know, and I experienced that timeline with my niece when I went back to see her because she's living that wonderful life, you know, and I thought I could have been doing this. But anyway, so then I started to act out, quote unquote, and started to be attracted to the punk scene. And I started going out with this terrible guy and I started doing tons of drugs and MDA, you know, oh my God, whatever. And then, and this guy was a real, real terrible guy. And he was like, you know, burning himself with cigarettes and locking me in the closet. And, it was mm -hmm. like, and I was like, I was working and going to U of T and he was lying around at home. And he wouldn't let me drink, which is kind of weird. It's like, I think he knew that I would get out of control and like rebe and re rebel against him or something. Right. So my parents were really worried about me and because um, of this guy. And so my grandfather, uh, he basically shipped me out to the West Coast when I was 25. Mm -hmm. I ended up at an artist run center and uh, it was it was just a full on community of drinking and and debauchery <laughs> and <laughs> so i was often in blackout and unfortunately i was raped several times during that period and i remember waking up not knowing who it was you know having physical evidence of the rape so during that time i just drank more and more and more and i was in the art scene in the early days in the 80s and it just seemed like i I remember thinking, well, this is the art scene. Everybody drinks in the art scene. It's okay to drink, mm. you know, and um, thinking that I was, and, and there were a lot of heavy duty drinkers in our community. We were all drinking, but like, I don't think everybody was waking up with, you know, like knowing that they'd been sexually assaulted. And so then I ended up um, sort of getting into partnership with a guy. And then this is another part I think is my, was a survival thing. 
um, with this guy who had a good job and he was also a heavy drinker and we lived, we were together for like 25 years and we had like a big drinking culture going like had mm. people, like, you know, we had a, we had like lots of parties and we had like a radio show and we invite everyone over afterwards. And it was like, our place was like open, you know, open to everybody and people would come in and we were both DJs. And so it was like, what do you you know, it was really fun and except except that i was drinking we were drinking more and more and more and i was drinking more and more and more and more and more and more oh. and you know and then it started to get to the point where i even though i was in a community of people that drank a lot no one would drink with me anymore because i was such a misery case right <laughs> and i mean i was and so <laughs> so, um, so i was like you know I realized like, this is really not that fun. <laughs> right. And I, and I, re you know, and I, and I, I didn't even think, like, I remember I was riding horses at the time down in the Southlands, riding other people's right. horses. Yeah. And I was taking like um, bottles of vodka down, hiding it in my clothes, going out and like galloping around the, um, uh, you know, the Pacific spirit park on, right. uh, on, like, on $200,000 dressage horses, drinking right. and smoking. Luckily I was such a good rider. None of the horses ever got hurt. Thank the God. Yeah, but but I, I used to get really wild and, um, I used to race the guys on the mountain bikes mm. and, and I'd be like, get a horse, you know, and <laughs> it was really aggressive. And not oh, very nice. I'm sorry, Susie, but I, we need to take a little break. Um, That's good. But you, God, you're a good storyteller. Um, oh, but we'll be right back folks. Did you know that Vancouver Co-op Radio CFRO 100.5 FM has over 90 different shows produced by over 350 community members? This wide range of programming produced by our diverse group of programmers ensures that we have a show you'll love. We have shows on feminism, spirituality, disability rights, politics, unions, and parenting. We play jazz, indie rock, reggae, blues, and folk. We broadcast in a dozen different languages and have more First Nations programs than any other radio station in Vancouver. Find your show on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. All different, all the time. You're listening to Rethreading Madness on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. I'm Bernadine Fox, and I'm talking with Susie in the incredible Susie. Hmm. Susie, you were just talking about um, the fun you had horseback riding. Um, how did it go? Like, like you, you went from here to where? Because I know your life went on and before you got sober. So what else happened? Well, I had, um, so like I was really drinking a lot and I, but I was in denial like people are. And I still had a very good somehow level of confidence happening, you know, like I had, hadn't been like squished out of me at that point. So I managed to get a job in the government. And I remember choosing the job when I was 26, looking at the application and saying, yeah, this would probably be a good place to work because I won't be able to get fired from my drinking because I'll be in the union. Like that was why I took the job. <laughs> I swear to you, I'm not kidding. And I remember, I remember like, I was so okay, smart. Okay, so what year was this, Susie? This was 88. Okay, 88. So I worked from, so I got the job in the government and I was constantly in trouble. You know, like we used to call it getting pulled into the uh, principal's office. Right. I was got called, you know, to the headquarters, uh, you know, like, we think you have a problem because you're never here. There's a pattern and all this kind of stuff. And I, I was working in the, wel in the welfare office, actually. And <laughs> I was having a great time on the front desk. I mean, are you kidding? I'm such a social person. And um, I loved everyone that came in. And I really learned there a lot about, uh, that's another conversation, but I learned about social justice because of how mean all the other workers were towards the clients right I was just like I was so astonished at the disparity and I guess I just hadn't seen it close up before mm -hmm. and so that was part of um but okay so I'm working in the welfare office I'm getting in trouble all the time but I'm still keeping the job and a few times like I'm at the uh I'm up at Maine and 28th and that's where we all hung out and lived and everything and there was a liquor store right kitty corner across the street from where we lived and I was always in there and I, I would be drunk half the some of the times and I'd be sitting out uh against the liquor store wall or windows with my clients who were <laughs> drunk 
and, and they'd be like, I'm going. And they'd be like, have you got my check, Susie? Ha, ha, ha. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so anyways, I managed to keep it together. And I kept, and somehow, because, you know, it's a big place, the provincial government, I managed to keep getting promoted. How strange is that, Bernie? That's wild. <laughs> you know, and so I learned. But it from- sounds like you, Susie, just so you know, it sounds perfectly you. So. <laughs> keep going well, yeah. <laughs> um so like actually uh, one of the things i've clued into and I, I you know i keep i tell people this all the time when we're in the government at entry level is i realize that if you got yourself on committees it's a really good way to get promoted because you're with all levels right and they mm. see you and they know you and then if something comes up they go oh remember Susie? she was really smart let's put right. her I was able to get, anyway, so I'm at the welfare office and working. It's like the 80s and then it's the 90s. And then um, it's getting more and more drunken around our place and everything. But like, we're still, you know, going to work every day and everything. And I'm with my partner and he's working all the time. And and then um, I got a job at, oh, then I was really, so I think um, I caught, there was a big upset with uh, something I'd done when I was hung over or something. And um, so I looked for another job out of the welfare office and I the, And the goddess gave me a job in the, what was called the Ministry of Women's Equality in the 90s. Mm, I remember the the Ministry of Women's Equality, yes. Yeah, and you know what? It's the It was the only standalone ministry uh, dedicated to women's issues Mm. ever in the history of the world. And it never has been since. No, and it's gone now, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's been gone. It was a, it was an NDP thing, yes. but it was a wonderful place to land because there was all these incredibly woke, you know, really wonderful women working there. I agree. There, there was. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And so they realized quite quickly that I had a drinking issue and they brought me in and talked to me about it very gently and kindly. And they encouraged me to go to therapy. Mm. So that's when I started going to therapy in the early 90s. And I remember I had this wonderful therapist and she was like, you're going to quit drinking someday. And I'm like, no. And she's like, well, (laughs) you know, you are. And so, so we had this whole relationship. And so I, um, so like, it was really dysfunctional, but it was like, because of where, you know, how I was kind of holding the house of cards together, I kept going and working and stuff and, and partying and everything. And then, but then all these other terrible things started happening because I was in, I was in blackout all the time. Mm. And I, and, uh, and I was like, I was re- basically, I was just like, <laughs> It was terrible physically because I, again, I, I got raped, a mil- I don't know how many times because I would wake up, you know, and I would know and or I would have memories and stuff. And, and, you know, and so it was like, obviously that was going to take a toll. And uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry that happened to you. Thank you. I, Thank I know you. that society seems to think that if you're a woman and you get drunk and you get raped, it's your fault, but it is exactly. not your fault. And I'm so and sorry. I, Thank you. And I mean, that's part of it too, right? Bernie, thanks for saying that because like, you're right. I thought, oh, well, it must be my fault. I was drunk. Right. You know, and so, but I still managed to keep going and everything. And then, um, so it was in, we're in the nineties now and I got a great job in a wonderful social justice based uh, department when the NDP came in again. And somehow by, I don't know how, but the skin of my teeth, I got into this place, even though I should have been fired. And my ex uh, boss, when they asked her in the interview, you know, the big question, would you, you know, for me to get this big position, they were like, would you hire Susie again? And she said, no. And they're like, what? (laughs) And she's like, well, she's got a major substance issue. Anyway, so this is what was going on. I'm working in this fantastic job downtown. Every day I'm dressed in my little suit Mm. and I've got, I have got my uh, Nikki in my pocket. Mm. I've got, I got vodka all over the apartment in uh, little bottles everywhere, hidden. Mm. And every day at the end of my drinking, I'm like waking up and I'm like having to have three shots a frozen wow. vodka to get going in the morning. Wow. Then I would go so get up super early, go downtown, go to a greasy spoon and eat as much as I could to kind of like hopefully soak up the booze from the night before. Right. And then I would line my mouth with those. They they don't do those anymore. They're probably toxic. Those Listerine strips they had at the oh, time. Oh, God. Yeah, I remember those. Remember those? Yeah. And so I would and I'd go into my meetings and I would hope, and you know, and I would stay, you know, hope that I wasn't stinking, like hung mm. over alcohol. Mm-hmm. And I found out later, you know, that they all knew, but they, half of them were 
had issues too. And it was a really dynamic um, community development. And we were doing ministry and we were doing all this really fantastic work. So I was actually really into the work and I was able to be successful in there. And I'm still really good friends with those guys today, mm. you know, that, that, that have done, you know, really good stuff with insight and all that. But anyway, so I was like bottoming out in this job where they were, they would never have fired me because they really, they really respected m- my ideas and stuff. And then, um, then the government changed mm. and um, all the social ju- and Campbell, whatever his name was at the time, he, he took all the budgets away. I don't know if you knew this. I don't think anyone knew this in every social justice ministry, they took the budgets away and made us still stay in the office with nothing to do and no money to do it with for a year. Oh my God. So luckily I was with a bunch of really amazing people that were doing stuff on their own. Right. And we just right. kept that it was really depressing. And so then it was like, you know, it pe- the whole thing petered out. I was the end of that big, fantastic dream time. Mm. And um, I don't know if you remember Jim Green, but he was my boss. Mm-hmm. Was yes. I love him. I loved him. Anyway, so, um, <clears throat> so then it was like, oh, I have to go work back at my original level because I kept getting into these, you know, in government, they have these acting positions like mm-hmm. A slash whatever. Yes, and yeah. so I, I kept doing that and getting promoted in those positions. So because of, you know, whatever the bureaucracy, I had to go back to a clerk, a senior clerk. Oh, and in a different ministry. And I had, they made me go to this job because, you know, I was in the union or something still. And the job was the scheduling office at BC ambulance. Oh, so you could not have been more opposite. So I land in this like extremely uptight protocol driven environment. And uh, it's like, it's really hard grinding and men work where you're like making cold calls to these paramedics in the middle of the night. Can you please work? Can you please work? It was really, really difficult. And you had to be really good on the computer and I was good at it, but I hated my boss and I kept, I was drinking and drinking and drinking and calling in sick and whatever and not and blah, blah, blah. And then my big bottoming out, I was, um, my sister had called me and said, Susie, I can no longer allow you to pick the phone up when you, I mean, when you call now, I can't let my, I can't let the kids pick the phone up. If they see your number on the call display, this was back in that in 2002, because I can't have the children talking to you drunk anymore. And I was like, Oh, And then I was like, I knew there was something really wrong with that. Like somewhere back in my consciousness and as my essence of a person, it was like, that is not good that you're not allowed to phone your niece and nephew. And then that same year, really, I think it was the same 24 hour period I had, uh, I had got, I had been drunk, 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 woke up in the morning after two hours of sleep or something, still drunk, 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 immediately smoked a big one and had like, you know, half a bottle of vodka and then uh, I'm, sorry. Like, I'm not kidding I'm not kidding and then I was like okay I hate that new box of mine she's gonna get an earful <laughs> so I'm like phoning her of course it's early it's still 0600 I'm phoning her she's not there so I start phoning her boss who's the, the big superintendent he's not there so I'm phoning and phoning and phoning and I start and I end up phoning the premier's office <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is Susie Mill, and I'm going to schedule her a BC ambulance service, and I'm really pissed off. Because she's not doing anything. <laughs> so anyway, they were like, uh-huh, uh-huh. As my mother says, they're smiling and nodding sideways. Uh-huh. And, uh, and like, then I got off the phone, and then about 15 minutes later, I get a phone call from the head of my department, Ralph, and then he goes, Susie, the premier's office has called me and told me to get a freaking handle on you what is going on and i'm like ah blah, 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 blah. And he goes you are you have you been drinking and it's like six o'clock six thirty i go no 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 i just got a problem my legs hurting and i got some pain <laughs> and, and he's like uh no i don't think so so anyways i forgot to say something really important because i want yeah. to bring this my spiritual um journey into this and you know pre- pr- prior to this i was raised agnostic with no belief in any higher power i was told right. that any god and was about keeping the masses down and like nothing was real and it was all you know science and so i had a lot of trouble with that because i was kind of a spiritual little girl and like i i love nature and stuff and so i'd always really related to the narnia books with aslan the lion right. and so i had this kind of idea somewhere i think there really is a spiritual thing and so i'm walking along 
the street one day just before I got sober about a week or something before and I'm just up by that church um at Main and 12th where they were just building it and the they had built up part of the wall so there were these little windows and there was these chinks of light coming in and I was like I need to go in there and I was like really devastated about my life at that point like I was so so drunk all the time and needing drinking and it was at the point where I wasn't doing any good you know I'd be drinking all day and I still wouldn't feel drunk and all that and so I climbed up onto this dais or whatever you call it and and I got down on my knees and I prayed to what I called the goddess Mm -hmm. I said, please help me. If you're there, please help me. Please help me, Aslan. And so then, like, it was like two or three days or a week or two weeks later that this whole thing happened with my sister and the supervisor, because the supervisor pulled me in and said, we're going to help you out because we know that people have problems. And so we're going to give you time off work. You're going to go to whatever you, you can go to residential treatment if you want to, or you can, you know, with your doctor sign off, you can go to a treatment program of your choice blah 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 so at that point i thought i better i guess i better try quitting <laughs> and so i went to my doctor and she was um she was like a, my friend kind of which was not good and i'd known her she'd been my doctor for 35 years and i'd seen and and so she said she was great that day she was like okay you're you know yes i'm always worried about you when you come in here um for your appointments because you always smell like booze right <laughs> really so anyways so she sent me away and said go to aa and she gave me like five out of man or something mm. and so i was walking down the street and i saw this bar and i went in there and my last drink i had three triple vodkas in a row and i, did not, <laughs> and I didn't get drunk now if exactly. i had one triple vodka i'd be like sleeping underneath the bar i know I finish the drinks just well it's that thing about like you build up your tolerance right it's right. weird like when you're at that stage of alcoholism acute you know everyday chronic drinking like that right. Right. and i still had a healthy body i guess um what happened was what happens is like you could drink five bottles of vodka and never get drunk or other days you could have like one ounce and get really drunk really fast right is your body wow. i don't know why but there's probably some medical explanation so anyways sure. but let me let me just stop you there because we have to take another break Great. Uh, but we'll be right back folks. cfro has the most reggae and caribbean music of any station in the vancouver area start your week off with some reggae oldies on tuesdays from 10 30 a.m to noon with level the vibes Roots Reggae is on Fridays from midnight to 7 a.m. The Reggae Show from 6 to 8.30 p.m. every Saturday, followed by Caribbean Sounds from 8.30 to 11 p.m. On the first and second Saturday of every month, it's Reggae Extended Mix from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. and then Super Mix on the third, fourth, and fifth Saturday on CFRO 100.5 FM, Vancouver Cooperative Radio.
Threading Madness on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. I'm chatting with Susie about her journey through alcoholism to recovery. Uh, welcome back, Susie. You were Hi. talking about, uh, I think, uh, three triple vodkas. Yes. Little known fact about me is that I am allergic to sulfites. So for the first 40 years of my life, I thought I couldn't drink because, you know, I was doing the soft stuff like wine and beer and I would get drunk. I would say I would, my joke was that I would get drunk sniffing the bottle cap because I was so allergic to the sulfites. It would just get me drunk immediately. And then I discovered at 40 vodka. And of course, vodka has no sulfites in it. And so I- no. And so I could finally drink so long as whatever I put in it didn't have sulfites. And so at 40, uh, what all the other kids learned about as teenagers, which I couldn't because I was raising a baby, um, about drinking and what to do and what not to do and what does drunk mean and when to stop. I was <laughs> learning at 40, you know, so I was drunk dialing people and oh, it was it was crazy. It was insane. Oh, drunk I dialing. Know, it was so bad. <laughs> drunk dialing. I had a sign on my phone saying, do not call people when drunk. Yeah. It didn't <laughs> work. <laughs> so how did you, you had three triple vodkas and, um, and that was your last drinks. That was on June, that was on June 21st, 2002. And then I woke up on June 22nd on the summer solstice and it was also a significant date for me and other reasons. And I was like, okay. And so I went to an AA meeting that day. Mm. And I went to the AA meeting the at the Alano Club on 7th and um, Granville. I walked in there and it was like, just like in all the stories, I knew right away, these were my people. Right. And it was like, but I was so scared and freaked out. But anyways, I was there, I was in the AA meeting and I was just like, okay, so here I am. And so then I went home and I bought for the first six months, I was drinking that near beer. What is that? It's horrible. It's like one, I don't know, like half percent alcohol or something you buy. It's really popular now. You get all these non-alcoholic drinks like right. that that are like beer and wine. And in fact, there's whole entire chains now apparently for that. Huh. But um, so I was like drinking these, you know, these things that were that didn't have any alcohol in them. And I was with my partner and he was not prepared to quit at all. So he was still drinking heavily every night. And I can't like, I just like, that was a really hard period during the first six months, but I was so somehow I got hooked in with this wonderful organization on West 41st called Avalon Women's Center. Mm -hmm. And they, I was, I went to a meeting every single day there on the bus. And that's what got me through my first part, you know, like the six months. I remember taking my six month chip with my sponsor at the time, Gina, you know, and I remember her saying to me, I remember us saying, okay, well, I've got six months sober. Let's go celebrate. And she's like, yeah, you have to be careful because we're alcoholics and the word celebration means something different than it does for other people. (laughs) So so, so I kind of like stumbled through, like I was so lucky because I was off. They let me go off work on like, you know, short-term disability for a year. And I went to a meeting every single day at Avalon and I got some kind of like foundation in understanding that there would be a life a different life and so then um we my partner and I decided that we should move like really far away from all our friends because they were all still very active in the alcoholic scene and so we moved way over to another planet called Kitsilano we moved from <laughs> East, Van, East Van to Kitsilano Right. And um, like, it's so funny because when I think back on those days, you know, it feels really slow and clean kind of, you know, moving over here and like going for walks and taking photos and really sort of like just kind of being quiet, going to lots of AA and everything. And then um, I managed to apply for a senior manager job and I got that and I kept, but okay. So 
during the early days of recovery, I was dedicated and absolutely immersed in AA. And I'm very thankful to AA for that. Because like, you know, I think what you were saying, like that the number one way to recover from trauma is like peer support. Mm. And so going to AA provided me well, a place. According to some people in some surveys. Absolutely. That Okay. I mean, I believe that's one of the most powerful things for people. Yes, absolutely. And so being with people that didn't drink and hearing and like they have all this rhetoric in AA. I mean, you may not, you may or may not be aware, you know, where it's like, you know, you go to meetings until you hear your story. Oh, because then you hear your own story because there's no original stories in alcohol. You start right. drinking, you drink too much. And if you don't stop, you end up in either three of three places, the hospital, an institution, the hospital or jail. Right. That's it. Right. There's no other like if you, you know, anyways, I, I'm getting all excited about that because like, I, I believe that, you know, I think now, like, I, I just think alcohol is so like, what is the point of it? You know, like it's the only drug that doesn't enhance your brain. It just goes in and kills massive amounts of brain cells. And yeah, that's why, it's, it's and that's why people, yeah, yeah. And that's why when you're dr- drinking, you slur your words and fall yeah. over because you're yeah. missing those parts of your brain. Right? Yeah, like, yeah oh exactly. God. Um, the, the thing with vodka, uh, and I know this from having chronic fatigue, um, is that with chronic fatigue, your central nervous system gets messed up and vodka will shut it down. And so we, we really don't appreciate the impact that, that booze has on your body. No. So it's one thing to take a shot of vodka every once in a while to shut down an anxiety attack. Cause that's what you have. But it's a whole other thing to shut down your nervous system all day, every day for many, many years. That would be bad. So, yes, anyway. that is what like during this time, I don't know, like I feel like like I was being somehow, you know, I was really, you know, I was like this innocent a uh, sober person and I was like counting my days you know being back to back days and it was okay and then you know um then things got chaotic in my partnership and then it got really chaotic and I had broken my hip in 2000 um so I had I I remember I was like really 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 vulnerable and upset with stuff that gone on with my marriage or whatever and I went to the doctor in 2007 so that was like when I was five years sober and I told her that I had hip pain and I asked her for Oxycontin and she gave it to me. And so I started, (laughs) I started abusing opioids at that point and it just got gradually worse and worse and worse. And then like my job, you know, they were, they, I managed to get out of there somehow without totally ruining everything because they, they knew at the end, but they gently kind of got me push, 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 put me in with my eligibility for my pension at 55 and stuff. So I got out of there relatively like, you know, not, I didn't ruin everything, but, but anyway, I started doing the opioids and I started doing more and more and more of them. And I was so um, into them. And I was like going into the doctor's office and, and like fudging, like, you know, going behind her back and taking my file and fudging the records and like doing all this stuff. Right. And I was lying lying, and I was getting more and more dosage and I was up to 200 milligrams a day of oxy uh, in like in the, in like 2013 or something. And she, the doctor told me later or whatever, like she kept saying to me, Oh, you're here for your drugs. eh? ha ha ha. And then she, she said to me, I'm doing this for, like, I know you and your partner broke up and that you're devastated and on the verge of a breakdown or whatever. She goes, so I'm doing this for harm reduction so that you don't start drinking again. Is that not the weirdest thing you've ever heard that's, in your uh, life? Yeah, that's... No, uh, so, um, yeah. you know, just ridiculous. And didn't she also put you on Ativan at one point? Yes, that's right. So I was on Ativan and uh, Oxy, and I was also going to the downtown east side to get more. And this was, like, a really dark period of my life, you know, where I had, like, I was, I was lonely. I'd been with that guy for 25 years, and I was really unregulated and I was really scared terrified of everything I wasn't drinking alcohol but I was on the oxy and then I started to go down to the downtown east side and buy it from the drug dealers down there right. and um and that was a crossover with I was still working at that point so I'm going on the downtown east side in my you know my Ellen Tracy business suit and I'm like mm-hmm. looking for 
I know. And and I had a couple of really close calls down there, you know, where I could have died. Right. And but I didn't care. I was just getting the uh, and then the goddess the goddess stepped in because just when I someone told me or something that you could take oxy and smack it all up and snort it. Mm. I didn't know that before or something or I hadn't thought of it. And I was just about to try it. <laughs> and that rule came out where they changed the they changed it so that it's you can't you can't um break it up anymore it starts bubbling or something wow you know what I'm talking about it's like when you buy those or when you get those pills you mm. can't you cannot like it says on there do not crush or break or whatever because if you do it changes the whole constitution of them anyway so that happened and i believe that saved my life wow because if i'd started snorting at that point i was you already at, gone. You know, yeah and and like you know and I was so desperate and unhappy and scared and so yeah. then I went through this whole period and I was also taking care of myself to like I can't believe you know I was so able to because I kept in with a bit of the social scene of the art world mostly I was just lying around watching uh, um Downton Abbey and Mad Men and Game of Thrones over and over and over and over and over again like oh, I just you there, know why you, you do know. that do you know why you do that no uh well I shouldn't speak for you, but I do know from the issue of trauma that the way you do that is, is especially when you're watching the same kind of show like those where they have the yeah. same kind of script, right? Yeah. Right. It always runs through the same script and, and you're watching reruns and reruns is because you're regulating your experience. You know what you're about to watch, you know what you're going to feel, you, all of those things so it normalizes and, and and narrows things down so nothing comes and surprises you that um you sense. sorry it that makes make. so much sense because it's like it, it's such a relief to be oh yeah everything's gonna be the way i know it's gonna be yes exactly and i'm gonna be okay because i was okay yeah. the last time i watched it you um you were talking before about how you felt that trauma had impacted on you um and we talked a little bit before this we're talking now about how our world has pathologized a normal response to trauma um and you were talking about self-worth that you recently yeah. came through something with self-worth can you tell our audience a little bit about that yeah sure um i think self-worth and not having it is like every single human is like i don't know why everybody does that to themselves they got the negative voice of the self-critic or whatever and it's so devastating and i i didn't believe i had any worth at all in my in, in who i was or anything like i i like i think that like i was confident until mid the mid times when i was drinking and then during the um the aughts or whatever I just lost all my confidence and I just knew that like I was worth nothing on I was like I mean do you want me to t to read them that thing I read you yes you? yes please okay read well okay because like I you know I I know that um okay I'm just gonna read this so the committee of assholes voice voices are so clustered together and prominent they set their little army of predators into my actions and my mind judging each one negatively it's that old familiar place of feeling worthless utterly so I am the stuff of a dirty work boot outsole. It's cleats and jagged openings filled with the dank, unspeakable downtown east side street filth. That's what the voices tell me I am. The evil, negative voices of these self-critics that consume my entity. This easy thinking trap of destroying myself is so deadly and narrowing, effective and punitive and cruel. It is sniping me downwards and hitting me over and over saying, every little thing you do is worthless. You are so wrong in yourself and in the world, you may as well die. Mm -hmm. And so that being said, I'm gonna read you this, not read you, but when I started my real serious recovery, when I got sober from the opioids in 2007, I mean, 2018, that was like September 7th, five years ago, I somehow like I had the doctor had been called in and, and the, my, my file was red flagged. And so she said, okay, we're going to taper you off. And so 
2016 we started and she took me down 10 milligrams a month off the oxy so my last pill was september 7th 2018 and oh. i was so lucky to have a doctor do that right you know like every time i see somebody or read watch one of those movies about that whole thing it's like no wonder they can't get off and i wouldn't have been able to either unless i was like so anyway there's this so i had i was at the bottom of my who i was and everything like that but right. i had because i was feeling more healthy and sober for the first time in my life because of course taking the taking it down like that you know meant that I wasn't as stoned at the end I had this like I was like okay I'm sober and I started to feel pretty good <laughs> that's good <laughs> go, you know and it was like and then this friend of mine like like she she took me to Hawaii for three weeks for free to stay at her place and she said I'm doing this because I know that you're coming through some stuff right now and I want you to know in a physical way that you're fantastic and you're a hero and so I'm in Hawaii in this gorgeous incredible place and I'm like well okay so I must be not that terrible because how <laughs> otherwise how the hell could I be in, in Hawaii for three weeks for free like I must be I must be not a terrible person like <laughs> and so it's hard <laughs> that's to funny how we, re like, we equate those was, things yeah <laughs> I was like it, it's sort of like they're my, you know like I okay so then I came back from Hawaii and I and that was in early 2019 and I was like okay I am just going to continue on this thing of thinking that I'm not that terrible and so I started taking um CBT cognitive behavioral therapy classes mm. and I started getting into some really um I and and that was great for like a couple a year or something and then i decided to tackle my sex trauma and i have mm. been in with salal or which is like the sex assault center here and i've had like three years of intensive work with one-on-one -on -one therapy and i'm in a lot of groups that have like women who've experienced sexual assault we share on zoom together and that's mm. incredibly empowering and this thing that i heard which rule which is like the thing the overall kind of mantra for my life and has been since i had this major awakening of sobriety is when shame dissolves power takes its place mm. and it's so true and so i've been working so hard to dig out this horrible shame that's been in my body and uh, aka the trauma that's been in my body that's kept me in hyper awareness always moving at 100 miles an hour and i i can be thankful for that chronic anxiety because i think that's how i got through that government job was this right. pure anxiety right? right just like run 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 and so another thing that i learned in um in salal and with this sex uh stuff was sex assault therapy was that there's you know we talk about triggers and people use the word activation now all the time but the opposite of a trigger like a trigger is when you go reverberating back into the past right and you mm -hmm. you're there and the opposite of a trigger is a glimmer oh interesting and yes so and they about a glimmer beautiful it's like such a great thing because we've all experienced it you know we even have it in the english language we say a glimmer of hope Right. And that's because it's this thing where all of a sudden we've all experienced it where you suddenly have this idea feeling that you're looking forward and everything's going to be beautiful. Everything's going to be really great. Yes. And they don't last that long, but everybody has them. And that's like becoming, that really helped me was to think like those two things, especially. And then I did all this horrible, I had to do all this work with the therapist where I was going back and remembering things. And I developed insomnia because of mm -hmm. that. And I've never had that before. And I was, that that was, and my body the next day from the insomnia, my body thought I was going into an opioid withdrawal. So right. it was like really hard, but I, yeah. I worked. I worked through that by becoming friends with my body for the first time in my life, Bernie. Wow. Like I never noticed I had a body before until the last couple of years. Like and I remember, go ahead. You are doing this Vegas nerve thing yes. with cold water. So I know we're, we're actually over time, but please give us a short version okay. of that. And then unfortunately you have to go, but tell well, us what you're doing. Cause I, I see it on Facebook. You jump in the water. You come out, well, you look shiny and happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, what I like to do is go at high tide because it's magical. And mm -hmm. I go down in the cold all through the winter. I go every second day and I jump straight in. I, I walk in and then I dive in 
to the water and I go for one or two strokes and it resets everything. And it's an amazing, incredible experience to get that cold plunge. I just love it. And that's been like, that's really helped me to be connected to my higher power Aslan, to my spirituality. And then right. the key word here is like, in I've been able to integrate myself. Wow. That is so cool. We have to stop Susie, but thank you so much for sharing all of this. It's been your story is amazing, and I'm so glad you're here at this point in your life. Thank you so much, Bernie. I've really enjoyed it. I hope somebody gets a bit of help out of this, and I love oh. all humans. <laughs> yes, that's good, because all us humans need to be loved, don't we? I know, <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay, all right. Talk to you soon, thank you. okay? okay right. Thank you. You're welcome. That's that. Wow. Do you feel unsafe in your home? You are not alone. Transition Houses offer free support and shelter for women and children. We are here for you. We are here for you. We are here for you. Make the call. 1-800-VICTIM-LINK 1-800-563-0808 bcsth.ca And that's our show. My thanks to Susie Milne for sharing her story about recovering from sexual trauma, alcoholism, and substance abuse. For all the amazing things she is beyond recovering, it is stories like hers that show us that we can all survive the trauma of our lives. Music today was by Tears for Fears and Sherry Ulrich. But most importantly, my thanks goes out to you for joining us today. Stay safe out there. You've just listened to Rethreading Madness, where we dare to change how we think about mental health. We air live on Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO, 100.5 FM, every Tuesday at 5 p.m. or online at coopradio.org. If you have questions or feedback about this program, or want to share your story, or have something to say to us, we want to hear from you. You can reach us by email, rethreadingmadness at coopradio.org. This is Bernadine Fox. We'll be back next week. Until then. When I've never been further Knowing what the hell I'm gonna do When I can't seem to find my way Under or over or through Just when I'm ready Just words people say to be